after uh, we're going to get a so we're going to get it started uh, so welcome 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 is that on welcome everyone to our our medical engineering seminar series hosted by the department of biomedical engineering at columbia university i'm ed guo and chair of the department and professor here at columbia so today we continue to offer this lecture in a hybrid format with both the virtual and uh, live audience here our speaker will present for approximately 40 to 45 minutes and uh, uh, Milan said it's going to be 42 minutes exactly, so we'll have to see that. Uh, we leave about 15 minutes at the end for question and answer. Uh, for our virtual audience throughout the presentation, please use in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, to submit uh, your questions. So we'll try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A sessions at the end. For our live audience, you will have a chance to ask any question during the Q&A as well. And then we will have this uh, microphone passing around. So today, so we're excited, excited to welcome Milan Eager. Uh, we're only taking us about two years to get a Milan here because uh, exactly, almost exactly two years ago, uh, Ilan stopped by, I will say it's one, one of the best receptions at the BMES annual meetings. And uh, he offered to come to visit it. I said, of course, come to visit it. And then the rest of the history, right? You know what happened you know, two years ago. Um, they delivered that then less than two years ago. So Mr. Yeager is a longtime Washington lobbyist and uh, association executive who has over 30 years senior government and public affair experience in public and private sector. His background, including senior government positions in the administration and the Congress, as well as private sector experience with um, National Trade Association and his own business consulting firm. Mr. Yeager is currently executive director of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Institute which is Biomedical Engineering, Biological Engineering, a honorary society of the most accomplished innovators in the field of medical and biological engineering. Uh, previously, he served as administration political appointees to the regulatory agency, hold the senior lobbyist positions for the two national trading associations. So therefore, you know exactly what's going on in this morning right now in Congress, right? And uh, testifying before Congress was the chief of staff of a member of Congress and the candidate for public office has participated in congressional and presidential campaigns. So he's a graduate of the University of Iowa has a master's degree in public administration from the American University in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Milan. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> Let's begin our discussion of innovation in a lunchroom. It was Laurel, Maryland. Whoops, we'll wait till my slides catch up. Let's begin our uh, discussion of innovation in a lunchroom. It was in Laurel, Maryland on a Monday morning, October 4th, 1957, when two 20 somethings about the age of many of you in this room um, were uh, by the names of William Geyer and George Wiffenbacher were having lunch. News had just been released about the Soviets launch of Sputnik. These two researchers at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory started talking about whether anyone had tried to listen to this thing. Within hours, they were back in their labs monitoring the, ra the Sputnik's uh, radio transmissions. You see, the Soviets didn't think anyone could believe they could actually achieve this uh, launch. And so they had made it easy to hack into the 20 megahertz satellite communications. Geyer and Wiffenbacher started recording the bleeps as well as timestamping each bleep. Soon they easily mapped its trajectory. Now their boss heard about this and said, can you do the opposite calculation? 
You see, at the time, America was preparing to launch a group of Polaris nuclear submarines that could remain in the depths of the ocean for long periods of time. And that's perfect for avoiding detection, but not so great if you need to fire a missile from an unknown location in the ocean and hit a specific location in Moscow. That lunchroom conversation provided the spark that 13 years later led to the formal development of the global positioning of space-based satellite navigation, providing location and time information for any place on the face of the earth. Today, after the federal government invested $5 billion in research, development, and deployment, 30 satellites crisscross the globe, making it possible for each one of us in this room in a matter of seconds to find a Starbucks after my remarks. Good morning, my name is Mylon Yeager and I am the Executive Director of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, AMBI, an honorific society of the most accomplished in the fields of medical and biological engineering. AMBI's uh, fellows are peer nominated, peer reviewed and peer elected. Our mission is to promote excellence in and advocate for the fields of medical and biological engineering. AMBI's fellows are among the top 2% of the medical and biological innovators driving the discoveries that has established America's medical and biological innovation ecosystem, the greatest in the world. This innovation infrastructure at its core is a partnership between federal financial investments and America's universities that has established the United States, uh, enabled the United States to achieve unprecedented prosperity, security, and quality of life. Like the GPS that has replaced our maps, no one questions the importance in our lives of science and innovation. Where would we be without invisible braces, cordless power tools, scratch resistant eyeglasses and home insulation among the everyday consumer items that are essential to our daily lives. You might assume these ingen this ingenuity came from America's great private sectors, labs in GE, GM, IBM, or 3M. And if so, you would be no Forrest Gump. Since 1970, 80 of the top 100 innovations in America have come from government funding at university research labs. The origins of the technologies and the products that have made America the greatest nation in the world evolved from basic research funded by the federal government at America's universities. Don't believe it? Just Google it. Take out that smartphone in your pocket and you can thank Uncle Sam for that. The lithium ion battery came from funding from the National Science Foundation. The GPS, as I've just mentioned, came from DOD funding. The CPU or the brains came from DOD. How about that touchscreen? That came from NSF funding. And the solid state full color display on your phone, that came from Naval Research and NSF funding. And where would we be without the federal funding that led to the digital library and the algorithms that we now call Google? No, seriously, you can just Google that to confirm everything I said. <laughs> no, seriously, it's just not these technological products where federal financial investments have changed our lives. Federal financial investments are literally the lifeblood of the innovation that has lowered healthcare costs, reduced pain and suffering, and prolonged life, not only here in America, but around the world. It is funding from the federal government for basic research conducted at research universities that has established the United States as a global leader in medical innovation. In the words of former President Ronald Reagan, he said, quote, although basic research doesn't begin with a particular practical goal, it is one of the most practical things our government does, unquote. For example, just take funding from the National Institutes of Health. NIH-funded researchers have won 93 Nobel Prizes, including five Nobel Prizes resulting from deciphering the genetic code for which untold medical discoveries have come and will continue to come. In the past 40 years, 
federal funding from NIH is credited with heart attacks and strokes declining uh, 60 and 70% respectively. Cancer deaths are down 15% in 15 years. An AIDS diagnosis is no longer a death sentence. The breadth and the impact of NIH research is clear when you realize that fully one third of all commercially patented medical applications cite NIH research. And when you see those slick commercials on TV about how the private sector drug companies are funding grandma's cancer, the fact is that NIH funding is responsible for 15 of the 21 most important drugs used in the United States in the past 25 years. And more relevant to our conversation, our lives today, virtually every major innovative vaccine used in the past 25 years originated with research funded by the NIH. An amazing success story, right? Everyone loves innovation. Innovation is the bedrock of America's past global dominance in the marketplace, at the bedside, on the battlefield, and for the frontiers of tomorrow. But seriously, who really cares? While science and scientists rock, and I include biomedical engineers as scientists, and yes, I think many of you guys rock, frankly, who even knows? Unlike rock stars, just 27% of Americans can name a living scientist. I can name a living scientist. Some are in this room, and nearly 2,000 of them are AMB fellows. And what about naming a place where innovation happens? Just 46% of Americans can name a place where medical or health research is conducted. For me, this question is easy. Medical research is done where AMB fellows work. 85% of whom work at research universities with public dollars, like here at a Columbia University. Yet the science behind innovation is too often invisible. And this is a serious problem. Innovation just doesn't happen by accident. Choices have to be made. Priorities have to be established. Leadership has to be navigated. Funding has to be prioritized. But today, things are different. America is different. The endless frontiers of science, health, and well being are different. Even the truth behind science, vaccines, and even the core of our democracy, elections, is now different. America's innovation ecosystem is in trouble. Check it out. Half of Americans don't think science is critical to the quality of their life, and less than a quarter, just one in four, see the role of government in science as essential. As a result, when asked what spending the public would cut to balance our federal deficits, one of the strongest responses was to cut science funding. The message is clear. The public doesn't believe government funding is important to science, and science isn't important to their lives. And that is a serious design flaw for innovation. A 1983 popular movie was The Right Stuff, a true life story of a group of test pilots and their training behind America's moonshot. NASA sent these test pilots around the country to increase public support for the moonshot, not to educate the public about rocket science, but to advocate for funding. The movie character of Gordon Cooper was asked by a member of the press, what makes a rocket go up? And he replied, quote, funding boys, that's what makes this bird fly, unquote. Gus Grissom, later the first American in outer space added, quote, he's right boys, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. Let me make my first critical point regarding America's innovation design flaws. It's not rocket science. It's about money. No bucks, no Buck Rogers. That's what makes the, the innovation bird fly. That's as technical as we need to get. No bucks, no Buck Rogers, no medical innovation. While spending on medical and biological research, 
by the federal government has increased for each of the last five years. There is little room for boasting about that achievement. After total investments in R&D declined since 2004, those recent increases in spending still make it almost impossible to see the slight rise on that line up there showing R&D spending as a percentage of GDP. While some want to talk about the vast sums America spends on R&D, a better reflection of America's commitment to innovation is showing R&D as a percentage of our GDP. Taken our country's wealth, what are we willing to return as investments for future innovation, health, and well-being? Now, some lawmakers have gone so far as to call recent investments in our country's R&D as milestones. But spending by the US for basic research as a percentage of GDP trails other countries like Israel, Korea, even Switzerland. Not surprising, today, the United States is no longer listed among the top 10 most innovative countries in the world. More importantly, check out the trend line. For more than a decade, each year, China has spending on R&D has grown by an average of 18%. This isn't the only trend line comparing the United States with China that worries me. Check out the trend lines for PhDs in STEM fields. According to a recent report, America's universities awarded twice as many doctoral degrees in STEM fields as China's Chinese universities in 2000. But seven years later, by 2007, the order had flipped and China began outpacing the United States US universities. By 2019, Chinese universities produced 50,000 PhDs in STEM fields, while the United States, our universities produced just shy of 34,000. This brings me to my second critical point regarding America's innovation design flaws, and that's talent. Winston Churchill, his military secretary, Ivan Jacobs, once said, the Allies won World War II, quote, because our German scientists were better than their German scientists, unquote. Anyone doubting the importance of America's ability to attract the best and the brightest to study, obtain PhDs, and do their research at America's universities need only catch out the following stats. Immigrants make up 18% of the U.S. workforce yet they've won 39% of our country's Nobel Prizes in science, comprising over 40% of STEM PhD graduates and 28% of science and engineering faculty at US universities, as well as produce 28% of the nation's high quality patents. For years, America's universities have been second to none, none and a welcoming home to attract the world's best and the brightest. The United States of America is home to 17 of the top 20 uni best universities and 46 of the world's top 100 universities. Further, the United States is home to approximately 150 research universities with annual expenditures exceeding $100 million on research. 79% of immigrants, entrepreneurs, who started venture-backed companies in the United States came here first to attend college and stayed to form their com companies. In fact, immigrants have founded more than 50% of the billion dollar startup companies in the United States. However, America is no longer a welcoming environment. As a result, total international student enrollments have plummeted 16% between 2019 and 2020 and statistics on new international students for the current school year are even grimmer. They're down 43%. Tens of thousands have deferred enrollment here in America. Since half of international students come to the United States to study in STEM fields of science, technology, engineering, and math, the implications for America's innovation ecosystem are serious. Now granted, post COVID, travel restrictions, these numbers will rebound. But let's face it, America is no longer the only country now seeking to attract the best and the brightest. And as a result of the rhetoric of some of our political leaders 
and the conversations on our social media platforms, many immigrants no longer find America a welcome home. Further, a discussion of America's innovation ecosystem and its need for intellectual talent, human capital, would not be a complete picture without mentioning concerns about declining interest by American students in college, as well as undergraduate students in science and engineering bachelor's degree programs. Today, US colleges graduate, uh, graduation rate now ranks 19th in the world. Ireland, uh, Iceland, New Zealand, even Poland have higher graduation rates. And check out what's happening in our secondary schools. Data suggests that only 26% of our high school graduates are academically prepared for a STEM program in our universities. This is no surprise when we learn that 93% of our middle school students in a, the United States are taught physical sciences by a teacher with no degree or certificate in physical sciences. In an increasingly knowledge intensive global economy, it's no wonder America has lost its position awarding the largest number of science and engineering doctoral degrees when we now lag in issuing science and technology bachelor's degrees. And now just two countries, India and China, award half of the world's science and engineering bachelor's degrees. While we sit idle watching these warning signs of design flaws of our innovation ecosystem here in America, our competitors in Asia have adopted our highly successful playbook with aggressive strategies to compete for tomorrow's intellectual talents. India now has a five-year plan to develop 1,500 new universities. Taiwan has invested $1.7 billion to develop world-class universities. Singapore is recruiting top talent, offering our faculty in America to come to their country with increased salaries and well-funded research labs. And the real competition might be China. Since 2000, the number of science and engineering degrees awarded in China have gone up 300%. And today, half of all degrees awarded in China are in science and engineering fields. While only 7% of the world's top 200 universities are currently in China, beware. In the past decade, China has doubled the number of their colleges and universities and is now investing $250 billion to develop the human capital that will make them a leading scientific powerhouse by 2050. In addition to foreign competition for intellectual talent, America is failing to make full use of all of our own American talent. In the words of NIH Director Francis Collins, quote, structural racism has become a chronic problem in our society and biomedical science is far from free of that stain, unquote. African-Americans make up 13% of the US population, yet they earn just 2.3% of the PhDs awarded. And sadly, that number is up one-tenth of 1% 1 in the last decade. And while the new head of the White House Office of Science and Technology and the director of the NSF, as well as the NIH director, are all now talking about the importance of diversity, the obstacles ahead are huge. The percentage of bachelor's degrees awarded to African-Americans has been flat in biological and life sciences for a decade. And the percentage of African-Americans obtaining a bachelor's degree in computer sciences is actually falling. Among the challenges for fixing enrollment and graduation rates, as well as PhDs awarded to Blacks and African-American students, including people of color to our university faculties. And finally, addressing research funding awards to people of color that have remained far lower than their white colleagues. To compete in a global economy, America's research universities need not only the best and diverse into intellectual capital, we also need financial capital. The picture here is also not bright. 46 states, are now spending less per student than in, for higher education than 10 years ago. Per student funding in nine states has dropped by more than 30% since 2008. Today, the average tuition 
at a public university and college in the United States has gone up 33% since 2008. Now, I'm not raising any new concerns. These design flaws for America's innovation ecosystem have long been known. How many reports does it take to warn of these concerns? The NIH, the NSF, the National Research Council, and even five major comprehensive reports by the National Academies of Sciences, count them, five major reports, have provided a steady drumbeat of warnings. These warnings include our PhDs and postdoc training programs are lasting far too long, the, and the highly skilled postdocs, many of you working 60 hours a week in a lab, should actually get paid more than the starting wage at Target. If I were my younger self in this audience listening to this talk while knowing I need to return to my studies, spend hours in the lab, face challenges obtaining my PhD, and then wait years for a tenured position while spending endless nights applying for yet another unfunded grant, I might have the feeling I want to blow up the entire biomedical career plans, or worse yet, blow up the entire system. Like the fictional broadcast character in the 1971 movie Network, maybe we should all just go to the window, open them and stick our head out and yell, I'm sick, sick as, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not gonna take it anymore. While it might provide a momentary satisfaction, I might suggest a more practical response. First, let us acknowledge it's easier to identify flaws than to find answers. But going to the window to express your anger or merely return to the classroom or your lab just to continue your lives is not among the solutions I will suggest. To start, we have to forget the conventional wisdom that science and politics shouldn't mix. This is the hardest step for many Amy fellows to make. They believe as scientists, they are above politics. In the technical literature, I call that crap. The truth is Harold Laswell, one of America's most noted social scientists of the 20th century once said, politics is who gets what, when and how. If scientists like many AMB fellows and possibly some in this room sit on the sidelines claiming to be above politics, then someone else determines who gets what, when and how. Engaging in politics doesn't have to be partisan. The challenges of our times and the opportunities of our cause transcends partisan labels. To hell with the Democrats or the Republicans who squabble over petty issues like there's some type of Game of Thrones empire set of questions. America is losing its passion for science. Innovation is in trouble. The issues involving biomedical innovation do not involve the shadow labels of red or blue that brand our elected lawmakers and issues such as climate change or vaccines as right or wrong. For me, and I hope for many of you in this room, the issues I have raised are a wake up call to get engaged, to become involved in public policy and politics. We need to be among those that determine who gets what, when, and how. So now, Let's get down to the nitty gritty, the basics. The first step in returning America's love affair with basic research and medical innovation is putting our issue back on the table. Former Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd from West Virginia once said, quote, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Former uh, or CEO or Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook and the author of Lean In, had similar advice for women and others when she said, sit at the table. How often those that have been passed over sat in the perimeters of these discussions while those that got ahead sat at the table. I challenge those of you in this room to get out from the lab and get engaged. Take Cheryl's advice and move from the perimeters to the table. 
your job description can no longer be limited to the science that occupies the perimeters of policy discussions. The time has come for those of us on the short end of government funding to stop seeing ourselves as victims rather than active players. So how do you get your issue to the table? How do you become an active player? In this regard, we might take our inspiration from Teresa Shook. In the weeks following Donald Trump's election in this Hawaiian grandmother, sat quietly at home wondering who would take the lead to protect the rights of women in the new administration. Lacking any resources, skills, direction, she couldn't find the answers. So she alone, a grandmother, learned how to establish her own Facebook page and using it inquired who might else join her to stand up for the cause. She woke the next morning to find that her Facebook page had been viewed and recirculated widely and 10,000 people in the first 24 hours had signed up for a rally in Washington she didn't know she was even planning. Weeks later, not just in Washington DC, but around the world, women, children, grandmothers, husbands joined together in the single largest day of demonstration ever. It was one person a grandmother from Hawaii that put her issue on the table. How about one of you? It's your turn now to put your issue on the table. Will a single march change the world? No, not likely. But if thousands, even millions of individuals each decide to join you collectively for a march, it makes a powerful statement. But more importantly, as powerful as a statement is made every day when millions of you do not do anything. I use Teresa and Amart as one example how one person can make a difference, can bring their issue to the table. But maybe it's not a march. Maybe it's joining your student government. Maybe it's requesting a meeting with your dean or even the president of the university. Maybe it's raising your issue on social media. Regular postings on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube keep medical innovation on the minds of our friends and neighbors. At a minimum, how about an email to a member of Congress? I'm often asked, you know, does an email really make a difference? After all, you're most likely to get an impersonal form letter back. And the honest truth is, no, it won't be a big deal. It won't change the world, but the silence of not sending your email not posting on social media, not requesting a meeting with the dean, not standing in a march, not sending that email also makes a statement, a statement made day in and day out by millions of us that fail to become engaged in simply sending an email to an elected official. Martin Luther King in 1968 said, and I quote, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And I know what many of you are thinking, you don't have the time. And after all, you're just one voice. How much of a difference can it really make? Rosa Parks, one person standing on her feet after standing on her feet for a long day work at work made history by not waiting for somebody else to come to the front of the bus. She didn't wait for someone else to determine history. It was Rosa on that day, in that place, at that moment to decide enough was enough. All of us think we're busy and every day we see injustice thinking tomorrow, tomorrow we'll have more time. And yet tomorrow, there's another day that's called tomorrow. Today is when we in this room must say enough is enough. Now is our time to become engaged. And the most effective engagement actually involves meeting with somebody face-to-face, -face, a lawmaker, a city or university official, face-to-face -face, or in today's world, the equivalent of a Zoom discussion in our current COVID environment. But life will return to something more normal as evidenced by my appearance here today. And when it does, the most important role you can have is meeting face-to-face -face with a member of Congress. Faculty and Amy Fellows will return to DC for study groups and conferences. And you students, you'll start traveling once again. And lawmakers will once again be hold, will hold town hall meetings here in New York and in the hometowns and communities where you grew up. We need to be there and we need to be prepared to be engaged 
and advocate for our cause. And in this regard, let me be frank, Donald Trump was right. The system is rigged, but not in the way he thought it was. As Amy Fellows, you are some of the most accomplished in the fields of biomedical engineering. And if you request a meeting, you will get one. As graduate students, you, should be, you, you, you would be surprised how many doors you might have open to you. The system is rigged for those of you with credentials, PhDs. You have instant credibility. People will listen to what you say and you just need to get engaged to use that influence. And here's my second challenge for Amy's fellows and for many of you in this room. You're just too damn smart. You have been in the lab for too many years and you believe that your data speaks for itself. First, when some of you talk about your research and your error, even your area of expertise, I have no clue about what you're talking about. Uh, to be effective, your conversation has to be targeted to a neighbor, um, not a scientific journal. I call this my Guinness principle. If you were in a pub sharing a pint, how would you explain your work? In this regard, we don't wanna speak down to a lawmaker or their staff, but also never assume the words and technologies that you use will be followed and they will understand your work. Second, keep the details about your research short. Like an elevator pitch, just give the highlights. This may be really hard for, uh, to understand, but when meeting with a lawmaker, the conversation isn't really about your research. Like Gordon Cooper answering the question about what makes a bird fly, it isn't about rocket science. Frankly, it isn't about science at all. Those of you on the frontiers of science love to talk about the obstacles, the little details, that missing piece of the puzzle that you spent years and possibly millions of dollars trying to solve. I recall an Amy fellow that I took to meet a US Senator and we practiced for over an hour to get his story down to an elevator pitch. Half of that time was just to get him to use words and phrases that um, are only recognized for, uh, by a colleague, but more likely could be recognized by somebody like me. The other half of the hour was spent trying to convince him the details of why it was hard to make a medical device the size of a pinhead and put in the back of someone's eye was not critical to the conversation. The Senator wouldn't understand all the technical detail. Trust me, the Senator was incredibly impressed by this Amy fellow that made something the size of a pinhead and put in the back of someone's eye that generated light impulses that gave a blind person the first images they'd had in their 52 years of life. The, the Senator didn't care or even appreciate the complications, the setbacks, the details. Similarly, put away all that data. No one wants to see your spreadsheet. No one is going to remember the numbers. Save that stuff for a journal article or for colleagues or the FDA when you're trying to make it reproducible. Take climate change as an example. The planet is warming. Glaciers are disappearing. Do you think the lack of global action is because we don't have enough scientific data? Or that it's simply a matter that somebody with a PhD needs to get a meeting to show their Excel spreadsheets? A simple Google search, search can confirm an overwhelming 97% of climate scientists agree that climate change is happening and that global warming over the past century is extremely likely due to human activity. The positions taken on climate change have less to do with data than the divisions of tribal warfare, even Facebook. I doubt this is probably news to anybody in this room. Even the halls of Congress know that today we live in a post-truth world. Oxford defines post-truth as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influenced in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion or personal beliefs. From the perspective 
of a middle-aged coal miner. He feels like global warming is just an economic assault by the Harvard elite and the fake news establishment. We misjudge that person as hating science or failing to understand scientific facts when it's more likely his, motiva his, his motivations are shaped by economic feelings. Or how about that housewife in the Midwest who generally thinks, doesn't know a lot about climate change, but generally thinks it's maybe a little overblown. For her, acceptance of climate change means everyone must change the light bulbs in their home. And she feels like that's just not the way free markets uh, work. For most people, climate change, like medical research, isn't something they generally know or even think much about. Making the connection between fresh air, fossil fuels, and climate change is hard for most Americans as the connection between government money, basic research, and finding a miracle cancer drug. But what people do care about is a better tomorrow. They want an end to Alzheimer's and dementia. They want a cure for cancer, a treatment for hepatitis, sight for the blind, movement for the paralyzed, and a future for a sick child. They want hope. Federal funding for research isn't about research. It's about a cure. Research is a means to an end. Funding basic science is important because knowledge is about finding answers. How does our brain work? Or why 5.5 million Americans have Alzheimer's and can't remember the name of their daughter? Yet, this is where science advocacy is hard for scientists. Few would modestly claim they're working on a cure for Alzheimer's or finding the cure um, for cancer. This is where you have to introduce yourself and pivot. Give a brief explanation of your research and now tell a story. Your research is about finding a cure. Jack Valenti often has been referred to as one of the most influential lobbyists of his time. He began his career about the age of many of you in this room when he was a young aide at LB, with LBJ on that sad day in Dallas, Texas, when the president had been assassinated and Johnson turned to him and said, I need a Bible and an oath of office for the quiet flight back to Washington. Jack Valenti went on to become the president of the Motion Picture Association and one of the most powerful lobbyists in Washington. Valenti is famous for saying, the six most powerful words in lobbying are, let me tell you a story. Once a year, the president of the United States is given the opportunity to speak to a joint session of Congress and the nation. It is during the State of the Union, address, the president will unveil their major policy initiatives for the coming year. Will they use an Excel, Excel spreadsheet, convincing data, rocket science? No, they'll begin by pointing to an invited guest seated next to their spouse in the balcony. And they will point to that American and they will tell a story about that single person. It is that story, that feeling, that connects all of America to that one individual and the president's initiative. All of us, we know somebody with cancer, someone with a parent that they're caring for with Alzheimer's. Don't be afraid to use their name. Let their name and your research lead us to a cure and inspire us. Your story needs to be about a real person. Identify them by name, make it personal. Explain how your mother, Linda, or a specific patient, Jack, or show a picture of a little child named Grace. Discuss their illness and explain how the cure is only going to be possible if we can find an answer, solve a mystery, 
Just do the research. These stories are more important than just connecting a name. Every major newspaper today begins with a story. Their story begins with a name. Joyce or Emily had this problem. We remember the article because of the story and we find it important because of the name. I spent many years on Capitol Hill and lawmakers, even senior staff, spend every day, day in and day out, in eight to 12 minute segments, meeting with constituents, talking about price supports and fire plane sales to Israel, or forest fire managements in the Northwest, or school lunch programs, and a damaged bridge needing repair, and so on and so on. And lawmakers are bombarded with meetings and details and facts all day long. And when the sun sets, their brains are just full of mush. Yet, they will remember your conversation about Daniel or Sophie. And they'll connect it to your research. And they will remember your conversation because of a story. More importantly, I can give you hundreds of examples where lawmakers have repeated stories and told about the importance of spending for federal dollars on research because it was needed to find a cure. If they repeat your conversation, you know they're gonna vote for your funding. And that is what we call advocacy. Let's be blunt. If you believe in a cause, it's not about educating other people, it's about advocacy. This is not a classroom. Advocacy is about changing minds. It's about persuading others. So let's get to the basics. First, you gotta get involved. You gotta sit at the table, you can't stay on the outside. Second, you gotta use your PhD, your credentials to get the appointment, but then forget the data, leave the details at home. When talking with a lawmaker or even a member of the press, introduce yourself, give a quick summary of your credentials and that establishes your expertise and gives you the credibility so people are going to listen to what you have to say. Next, get into a 60 second elevator pitch about your research, that's all it should take. Without the details or data, just explain it. And then tell a story about a real person identified by name, and then connect that to your research and the answering the puzzle to addressing melanoma or dementia or blindness or diabetes. Remember, you gotta make it personal. Telling the story connects us to the feelings and the feelings, they're the pixie dust that will provide the votes to get us the funding to do the research. And that brings us to another critical point. Don't forget the ask. You had the meeting for a reason, not to talk about yourself, not to talk about the research or the data. It's about asking for money. Be direct, ask for money. Remember, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. And don't concern yourself with where the money's coming from. That's not your job. Trust me, in America, there's money for any priority. That's their job. Your job is to convince them you have a priority. The challenges of our times and the opportunities of our cause, folks, it transcends partisan politics, but the times they've changed. America has changed. In a post-truth environment, we must follow the rules of the game and give people hope. That hope might be America's next moonshot. Maybe it might be the brain initiative. Maybe it's a cure for cancer or sight for the blind or a movement for the paralyzed or a future for a sick child. Americans, they're looking for a hope, a cure. It's up to us, those of us in this room today to determine if we're gonna look back and accept America's innovation design flaws or look forward and get engaged in the pursuit of endless frontiers. With so much nastiness and shouting in our public discourse, I tell you right now, we are bigger than this. Our vision for America is clearer. Our mission more important, but it can only begin with one person one of you willing to say it's going to be your cause to make a difference. You know how to do it. 
And it begins with putting our issue on the table, changing the conversation, and it ends with, let me tell you a story. The story of Bob and Linda and Nana, it's a story about discovery, and that is the pixie dust for finding federal support and the congressional willpower to achieve the funding that will deliver the cures and maintain America as the global leader in innovation and medical research. We know why it's important because there's going to be a day, a moment in everyone's life when in a doctor's office, the question is going to ask, get asked, is there a cure? Is there something the doctor can do? Every family will have someone they know ask that question, someone that we know, someone that we love. Hope. It's more than the pixie dust of our stories. It is the comfort for the afflicted and the wellspring of energy that we use to fight for a better tomorrow, for endless frontiers, no matter the odds. Thank you for your time. Wow, thanks very much, uh, Milan. I think that's really uh, wonderful and a very honest tell the challenges we have in the US in the STEM, uh, as well as really, you know, we can learn quite a lot as professors, as students, how to make in a presentations. Um, so uh, thank you. And uh, so before we go into the questions, I just want to call everyone's attention to our upcoming hybrid seminar. Uh, so next Friday, November 12th, we will have, uh, we will hear from Ashley Lovely from Well Cornell Medicine as she presents system as analysis of tumor microenvironment crosstalk induced by chromosome instability. Uh, please follow us on social media to receive latest updates. You can see our social media information on the slide. You can always access the registration information for our DME seminars from our website as well. So I'm going to pass in this one to Lisa for handling the questions. So do we have uh, any questions from the audience? You know, it was really inspiring and uh, a little out of our usual talks. The first question is the hardest. Somebody start us off. Right here. Okay. Uh, thank you. This, so this is, uh, I guess, a more policy-based question that, uh, like, I think is underlying all of this. You talk about all of the innovations that have uh, eventually made it into everyday use uh, and their corporations who have taken uh, technologies that were developed in like academic environments in collaboration with the federal government and using taxpayer money. Um, what exactly can be done to actually help taxpayers recoup some of that money when large corporations make a lot of money off of that investment? Yeah. and then feed it back into investment. Yeah, we're doing better at recouping some of that money and not just for um, recouping it for the federal government, but universities recouping some of it for their research lab infrastructure and so forth. Um, I think much more could be done there. There are discussions of that, but it's above my pay grade. Um, I don't have the, I mean, I, I think that as we look at the innovation ecosystem, that is one of the questions we have to answer. Somebody has to answer. We also have to answer the efficiency of our university labs and even our teaching systems in our colleges. Uh, th there's some things that need to be reformed, but I can't answer all the questions nor bring all the answers to the table. I am here for the sole purpose that I want more money to get in the system because somebody's got to work on that. And that's where I work on in a &B's advocacy efforts. But clearly, we can't just keep pouring money in, even if we're getting results. The um, uh, mapping the human genome, you know, $5 billion. And look at the research that's come out of that. Uh, but to the US economy, we recovered $178 for every dollar that was spent. So my, we might not have recuperated a lot of the money from the patents that went back in, but the economy was so much better off because of it. So from a public policy perspective, 
I advocate for more money in the funnel because it brought more money back to our economy. But your question is legitimate. It needs to be answered. It's just not something that we're working on. But I, I appreciate it. So somebody else right here. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. So uh, I'm an international student. Uh, so first, thank you for uh, welcoming uh, me and uh, the other international students in your country. Thanks for studying here. <laughs> you, uh, we hope you'll make lots of patents and stay here with your family. I hope I will. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, there is still a lot of international students uh, in the US, uh, especially in like uh, your best university, such as Columbia. Um, but also you have like, as you explain the divide like less and less american believe in science and things like that um how do you explain the american public that at their best university uh, they are um their i guess tax money is used to on students from other country who don't pay taxes in the us um i feel like maybe kind of like the um animosity that is toward universities and science could come from that so what's your response to that well first off i could educate the public that in fact uh international students in many cases pay much more uh tuition than a lot of american students at the same institution and there are a number of academic or economic factors that i could bring to the table but if anything from my remarks i'm not going to educate the public a lot of people are just going to feel that you don't deserve to be in America and you shouldn't be here. I was at another university a couple of years ago before COVID, and there were two PhD candidates who were getting their PhDs and they had studied for 14 years in the United States. They felt America was their home and their visas were being canceled. And both of them were involved in trials for things that they were going to take into companies. And they're going back to India to, to do that. That's a shame. So what I would do is I think we have to do more social media of telling the stories where half of a billion dollar entrepreneur companies in the last 10 years have been formed by foreigners. They're here to create jobs in America. They're here to create our economy. And most of them came here to study and stay. That is a story that would be far more convincing than all the economic data that I could try to educate somebody. So we just have to tell more stories on our social media platforms about why America should always be the place for the best and the brightest. Welcome. Oh, okay, great. I think this will be our last question. So thanks for... <laughs> Hi, Milan. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Um, uh, one question is going back to the cause of uh, why research and science in this country, although it has a lot of people have benefited directly and it benefits the rest of the world, which is, I think, one thing that the states are doing well. Um, can we? Can you talk more about outreach? So how students... Talk a little more about outreach, what? Outreach. Outreach. Okay, outreach. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, pardon my Greek accent. Yeah. <laughs> How you can, uh, how we, we can benefit uh, high school students, middle school, elementary school, because that's where we have to go, right? It's too late yeah. by the time we get a, try to get a PhD, getting a PhD. Right. I mean, we can, this is a room you preach it to the converted uh, and uh, sorry, but it's easy. So how can we go to, to educate kids because they're really interesting in science and research. So what can be done better uh, from our, our point of view, but also globally? Yeah, I don't know if I have the, the right answer on that or the answer. Um, clearly, AMB is working on a lot of things to advance diversity within um, academia and medical research. And we can't solve that if we don't have uh, Latinos and African-Americans and others in our pipeline. So a lot of our work, even though we deal with the very cream of the academic world at the top, uh, if we're gonna solve it to your point, we have to somehow bring more people into the funnel early on. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of things in education that are answers that you wanna hear. I just don't know what they all are. 
What I do know is that kids mimic a lot of what they hear from their parents. And I'm guessing, and this is a uh, cheap answer, I guess, to give to you, but uh, I'm guessing a lot of you have uncles and aunts who know you're pretty smart. You got into Columbia. You know, Linda's daughter is at Columbia. She's really smart. I know she's doing some research, but they probably don't have any clue that as a student, you're actually involved in research, working for a couple of really cool faculty. And it's we haven't told that story to our uncles and aunts, so they don't appreciate it. So when they sit around the, the table, they say stories amongst themselves about, wow, the federal government wasting more money on you know, research, that basic stuff, not understanding if we had not spent $8 billion, we wouldn't have had a vaccine that quick. You know, we need to tell our own stories to uncles and aunts, and that might filter down. And I don't know if that's a good answer, but it's the best I can give you. Thank you all for being here. That's great.